Hi, Ben with Novolux Stereophonic. In this video, I'm going to be taking an in-depth look at the Marantz 3800 stereo console or preamplifier. I'll start out with a bit of historical info, followed by a detailed review of the front and the rear panels. And then we'll finish up by taking a look at the inside of the unit and I'll go over the restoration that was done and some of the challenges that I faced along the way. So if that sounds interesting, stay tuned. Let's begin by taking a look at some of the historical context around this piece. So the Marantz 3800 was manufactured from roughly 1976 to 1978. And during this period in Marantz history, they were manufacturing products in both Japan and America simultaneously. So the majority of the pieces that were built in that time period were designed in the US, but manufacturing took place in Japan. There was a select group of premium components that were manufactured uh, from start to finish in the US. And the uh, Model 3800 is among that elite group of components. So you can I identify those on the rear panel. There's always a plate on the back that's going to say something like precision crafted in the USA, while the Japanese ones will say designed in the USA, produced in Japan. Uh, so this is, is one of those premium level components. The electronic design of the 3800 is pretty straightforward. At the heart of this device is a device called an operational amplifier. It's an integrated circuit that's set up to basically create a 10x signal. So if you feed a 100 millivolt signal into the input of the 3800 and crank the volume control, you're going to see about one volt out. So that, that device is, is kind of the heart of this unit, and then everything else around it is just providing your typical preamp functions of source selection, EQ, filters, uh, mode, stuff like that. The model below this, the 3600, stops there. It's just a straight preamp with, with all those features I just talked about. When we go up to the 3800, it adds in a ton of tape recorder features. So we've got um, the ability to Dolby Eyes tapes. You can copy one deck to another while you're listening to other program material. So it's just loaded down with tape features. Now that can create some service challenges. It's more complicated, uh, but the trade-off here is the 3800 has this beautiful Dolby VU meter. If you go with the 3600, you're just gonna get this blue lamp. If you were trying to build a system around the 3800, the components that you'd most likely pair with this would be a 510M or 250M power amplifier, and maybe the Model 150 tuner. The amplifiers that I just mentioned are American made. The tuner is Japanese built. Uh, but they are all advertised together as a set in the 1977 stereo components catalog. So that would have been kind of the set that you would have built in that year if you were trying to go with American made separates and then have a tuner along with it. Okay, let's take a look at the front panel. I'm gonna push the power button here. And you might have caught it, when the unit powers on, this needle's gonna jump up and down a little bit. Now, Marantz implemented a circuit here. It takes about four seconds. When you power on the unit, after about a four second time delay, a little read relay on the left side here will click and it'll allow audio to pass through. The reason they do that is to protect against power on transients. So when you turn on this unit, the power supply is gonna charge, the voltage regulator is gonna to start to work and they don't want any of that weird audio signal getting to the power amplifier. So there's a four second read relay controlled time delay. Okay, looking at the source selection up here, we have two moving magnet phono inputs tuner and auxiliary, and then these are the tape copy switches. So what would happen with tape copy, for example, is say I have a, uh, a vinyl album that I've recorded onto a reel-to-reel -reel tape, and I wanna make a copy of that for my friend. I could select this button, start playback on deck one, and then record on deck two and make a copy of the tape. Now, the unique thing about this feature is it's independent of what's going on on the tape monitor switch and on the source selection. So while I'm making that copy of a tape for my friend, I could listen to the tuner or my turntable. So it's just kind of a feature that allows you to kind of stay busy while you're listening, I guess. I don't know if anyone would ever use it, but it's a feature that this unit has. Now on the 3600, these are just called tape one and tape two. Um, on this unit, they've given you extra features, but it means that if you do want to just listen to a tape deck, you have to use the monitor switch down here. So when you're in source, it's going to select any of these four. When you're in monitor one or monitor two, it's going to force you to listen to either of the tape decks, regardless of what's depressed up here. Okay, moving on to mode. Uh, it's going to be in the stereo position 99.9% .9 of the time. Sometimes I will switch this to stereo reverse just to make sure that my channel orientation is correct. Uh, L plus R is is in essence mono. It's taking all the information from the left and the right, adding it together, and then outputting that signal to both speakers simultaneously. And then right or left, 
This would allow you to take information in the left channel and output it to both speakers, or from the right channel and output it to both speakers. A possible use case for this might be if you're plugging a microphone into one of these jacks here, you could force it into left, for example, and then get the audio from the microphone to come out of left and right channel. For this next section, I'm going to focus on just the right channel. So we've got bass, mid, and treble. These are on sliders. These are the turnover frequencies. I'm going to put up a diagram in a second that's going to kind of explain what these do. We have filters and loudness. So I'm feeding a pink noise signal into this. Let's just take a listen here. So this is treble. Bass. And mid. And then what these turnovers do is kind of affect at which frequency the treble and bass operate. So the mid-range is unaffected, but if I push 250 hertz here, it changes the point at which the EQ takes place. And then same thing for treble. And then our filters are fixed. We're not gonna hear 30 hertz, it's just too low. Five kilohertz is drastically going to cut the treble and nine kilohertz is going to moderately cut the treble. So the way that these would be used is, the, in the manual it says the five kilohertz is only for extreme cases. You have some really noisy piece of media and, and you need to cut the highs out of it. That's what that would be for. The nine kilohertz is more practical. This would be um, like a typical uh, high filter or treble filter that's going to help if you have a very noisy stereo multiplex recording and you just wanna cut some of the noise from it. Now loudness, what this does is it raises the amplitude of the treble and the bass at low listening levels. So this is if you're listening at a very quiet level and you want it to sound flat to your ears, you would engage the loudness. Once you get the control rotated up to about 35-40%, the effect is going to go away. So loudness is just for listening at low levels. One other thing to note here, um, we have a tone defeat. So if I create a little EQ profile here and then I depress the tone defeat button in the bottom left, you'll hear that cut in and out. And the tone defeat does not affect the filters. So as I bring these filters in with the tone defeated, you can hear them making an effect. So these come after the tone defeat. In the bottom right here, we already went over the power switch, but there's also main and remote speaker selection. So I'll go over this in some more detail when we look at the back panel, it'll make some more sense. But basically we can use these to toggle in and out sets of speakers that are connected. Um, this is all Dolby related, which we'll go over next. Okay, we're gonna be getting into the weeds a little bit in this next section. The Dolby features of the Marantz 3800 are a little bit complicated. Um, but I've done a, an in-depth video on a very similar design, which is the Sansui 9090 dB receiver. So I'm gonna put a link in the upper right-hand corner to that video. Around the 11 minute, eight second mark, I go through a detailed explanation of how the Dolby circuit works, how to make a calibration tape and all of that. And the process is nearly identical to what you do for the 3800. So if you want some more detail on the Dolby circuit, go ahead and check out that video and then come back. Let's start out with the Dolby control. So. In 99% of the cases, you're gonna be using this in the off position. That means the Marantz 3800 is functioning like a conventional preamp. There's no Dolby encoding or decoding happening. When we switch to any of the Dolby modes, you'll see that the meter becomes brighter. This is by design. It's a visual indication that you've selected a Dolby mode. So when we go into Dolby Play, what's going to happen is any input signal that's coming into the preamplifier, whether it's on a line input, phono, or tape, it's going to apply Dolby de-emphasis to the signal. So the assumption is that the signal coming in has already been prepared with Dolby pre-emphasis. This, de this device is going to invert that and then the signal will go out flat. If you feed a regular line level signal without Dolby, when you're in the play selection, it's going to sound really weird. Dolby FM is an obsolete feature that used to be useful when radio stations broadcast in Dolby FM, which was almost almost none. <laughs> it really never took off and, uh, and no station is broadcasting in Dolby FM nowadays, so it's kind of a useless feature. Now, when we get into the record one and two, it gets a little bit iffy. So I'm going to put up a matrix that kind of shows exactly what this control does in each position to, to help you understand it if you're trying to connect this or, or use this feature. But the gist of it is when we're on record one, what it's doing is any signal that it's feeding to the tape output, it's first going through the Dolby encode circuit and putting the uh, Dolby preemphasis on the signal. That way you can record it onto a tape 
and then when you play it back you select play and it will have the noise reduction and it will be flat. Now what Record 2 does is, I'm not sure the use case, the only thing I could think of is say you've used Record 1 to make yourself a Dolby Eyes tape that you're going to play back on the 3800. You've got a friend that asked you to make a copy of the tape, but he doesn't have anything that will decode Dolby. So what you can do is you can go to Record 2. It's going to decode the Dolby signal from your incoming tape deck, but what it's going to send out on the record jacks is a flat signal. So you can transition a uh, tape with Dolby pre-emphasis to a flat recording if you'd like. So that's what that uh, record two is for. Okay, now we're getting into the metering circuit. So in the middle here, there's a Dolby meter that has the Dolby logo next to a little zero. And what this does is it allows you to make sure that you are feeding the Dolby decode circuit the proper level when the signal's coming back in. So there's a 400 hertz oscillator built into the 3800. So what I've done is I've taken the tape output and I fed it back into auxiliary so that we can listen to the tone. So if I depress this and raise the level, we're listening to the built-in oscillator inside of the unit. If we look at this, I'm in the Dolby play mode, you can see that the needle is lining up right on the zero there. Now, this is a button that selects which channel you're reading on the meter. So when it's in the out position, it's this channel here. So if I adjust this knob, I can optimize my Dolby level here. And then if I depress it, that's going to be the right channel. Now, one of the nice things about the 3800 is they give you individual play cal. On the 9090 dB, it's on a concentric control and you're relying on the balance of that pot and a lot of them have aged and this, the carbon tracks are not identical, so you can never really get it perfect. But because you have individual adjustment on the play cal here, you can really dial in um, the, the Dolby to be as close to perfect as possible with 3800. The, the record level knobs over here are meant for setting your actual record level going into the tape deck. So once you go through the whole calibration procedure and you set the record level on your tape deck, you don't want to touch that. So these controls allow you to alter the level. So if you've got a really quiet recording coming in, you can boost it here instead of messing up your calibration on the tape deck side. So that, that's what that's for. Okay, we're getting kind of down to the end here of the front panel. This is our channel balance for left and right. And if we slide it into the center, there's a little detent right here in the middle. It kind of locks in place there. This is a really cool feature that I like. It's called Tape Record EQ. This is not present on many preamps. What it allows you to do is alter the signal that's going out to the tape output jack. So say you have a source uh, recording a CD or, or a record or something and you want to record it to tape and you're always thinking, I just wish this thing had a little bit more bass or it's too harsh, I need to back off the highs. You could create a little EQ profile, listen to it, make sure it's what you like, and then you can push that button and it will send that equalization curve out on the recorded tape output jack so that you can make a tape that's compensated with how you want it to sound. So a pretty cool feature there. Uh, these dubbing jacks are TRS jacks, so they're a stereo jack and that is basically a copy of tape 2 on the rear panel. So you can access tape 2 here from the front and when you plug into there, it bypasses whatever you have plugged into the back. There's like a little uh, switch on those jacks so that when you plug in here, this takes priority. And then we already kind of talked about the, the microphone inputs there. So that's it for the front panel. Let's spin this thing around and take a look at the back. Luckily, the rear panel of this unit is a little bit more straightforward. So we have AC outlets here switched and then unswitched. This is the speaker connection section. So the way that this would work is you would uh, use the preamp output here to feed your power amplifier and then instead of connecting your power amp to a set of speakers directly you would feed the power amp back into this set of jacks here and that makes the front panel buttons main and remote available for you to select between two different sets of speakers using the preamp. Now another thing this adds is when you're connected here with the power amp you can use the headphone jack. The 3800 doesn't have a built-in headphone amplifier so in order to listen to headphones you have to plug in an amplifier it goes through a couple resistors and then goes out to the headphone jack. The Dolby FM section here, like I said earlier, is obsolete. All I've done here is set these levels so that when I'm flipping between off and Dolby FM on the Dolby selector that they have relatively the same output level. Let's jump over here to inputs. 
we have our moving magnet Phono 1 and Phono 2. When I got this unit, it came with a set of jumper plugs, so I polished those up and put them on uh, Phono 2 so that I don't get any extra noise there. We have tuner, aux, and then tape 1 and 2 inputs. And this is our output section here. So we can plug in two different power amplifiers. This is the scope output. This is kind of like a tape output, but it has a reduced signal level. And the design of this was so that you could hook this up to say something like the Marantz Model 150, use its external scope uh, inputs so that you can look at your line level waveforms using the scope that's built into the tuner. So that's kind of just like an extra set of jacks so that you can do that feature. And then we have tape output one and two where you would make your recordings. Okay, let's open this thing up and see what it's like on the inside. The first thing that always strikes me when open the, opening these American pieces is the blue PCBs, uh, really high quality boards that they used in these. Um, the top board that we're looking at here is the main preamp board. And if you look at a 3600, it's almost identical. I believe they even used the, the same board and just populated them differently depending on which model it was. So this is where there's usually a read relay in the 3600, for example. Over here is our power supply. Uh, these axial caps seem to hold up pretty well in this unit. I'll go through the caps in more detail in a second, but the more typical failure area in the power supply is the voltage regulator I see here. This is a TO66 package that's on a heat sink with some thermal compound and has many legs on the bottom. This one is fine in this unit, but I've heard stories about these failing in the past. This is what controls the plus and minus 18 volt power supply in this unit. Another failure mode in these is the operational amplifier. This is the 10X op amp for the preamp. And luckily there's a guy in Audio Karma that took some time to document how to replace this with a modern chip. So I've gone and replaced this with a Burr Brown IC um, and that turned out really nice. All right, we're looking at the unit from the side now, and as you can see, it's kind of an unconventional design. The way that this works is there's a vertical panel on the back here and vertical panel on the front, and they kind of sandwich together and plug into the main preamp board. Uh, and then in addition to that, there's a vertical board here that almost acts like a ribbon cable that connects to the Dolby board here, and the Dolby has a, um, like an outrigger daughter board on each side of it as well. On the 3600, it's just a u-shape like this none of this circuitry is in the middle so there's a lot of added complexity on the 3800. okay now i'm going to go into a little bit of detail on some of the parts that were replaced in this unit so the initial symptom on this one was it had no audio uh, and what i found on it is if you crank the volume control all the way you could get audio to come out of it but there was no other adjustment range so first i thought this volume control is probably damaged so i opened it up and took a look at it and it definitely was damaged so i'll show you what that looks like and on some of these American-made controls, this, this does tend to happen. Okay, so I got those removed. I'm just gonna pull this plate out. And we can look at these carbon tracks. Let's see. Okay, here's a close look at one of these carbon tracks. This section here, the carbon is completely gone. So when the wiper is coming around here, there would be no contact here. And that's what caused that symptom of no audio output. So what must have happened here is this control was already slightly damaged by maybe exposure to moisture or something like that. And somebody tried to clean it. When I got into this unit, it was this control was sitting in a puddle of contact cleaner. And you know, what a control is like that in a state that's already kind of deteriorated and then you feed it with a bunch of contact cleaner, depending on which cleaner you use, it can really destroy the track. So whatever happened here, it completely lifted the carbon straight off of the substrate. So that can happen from time to time in these controls. And another thing that can happen with these is they can develop channel imbalance. So this is for one channel and there's an identical wiper for the second channel. And sometimes they can get to where when you're rotating throughout the range, you get bad channel imbalance. So say you're at 10% volume your left channel might be louder than your right and you go up to 20 percent volume and the other channel is louder so sometimes these do need to get replaced so that's one of the challenges of restoring one of these is getting the volume control replaced okay let's look at some other parts so 
this is the original operational amplifier IC, and this thing kind of worked. So once I uh, got the volume control bypass and I was doing some more testing, I was, I was able to get one channel to work, and then as I was probing around, the second channel kicked in, and I really didn't do anything besides touch the pins. So um, this is something that these can become intermittent, so I was happy to replace that with a new chip. And these other parts are just peripheral components. The original IC is many more legs than the replacement. This IC needed a special external network to function properly, where modern operational amplifiers have those features built in. So I was able to pull a bunch of components that are no longer needed. So that's what all that's from. What else? Lamps, I ended up doing an LED conversion on this. And please don't ask me in the comments for a kit or anything for converting this. This was a one-off. I don't know if I'll ever see another 3800. And I just grabbed some LEDs from my uh, it's from my stash instead of a bunch of clip leads and uh, resistor substitution boxes and, and kind of dial it in. So I don't have any information on converting this to LED, unfortunately. So these are all the capacitors that I pulled out of the unit that tested good. These were within spec, um, kind of a mix of everything. So some axials, some radials, different brands. It was just kind of some of everything tested good, but a lot of other stuff tested bad. So. These ones here had extremely elevated capacitance. So let me let me check a couple of these out. And a lot of these will have a 20% a tolerance, but some of these are egregious. So this was 470 microfarad. Let's see what this one ended up at. This one might not be too bad, I can't remember. So this was a 470 microfarad cap. Test that's 770, so that's very high. Uh, so that's not quite where it's supposed to be. And then these ones were just straight up bad, so it looked like a lot of the small ones had failed. So it was a lot of the 10 microfarad ones. I'll just grab a couple of these. Some of them tested okay, but were starting to creep up on ESR. But a lot of them were just crazy high, 20 ohms of ESR or something, or really bad capacitance value. So that was supposed to be a 10 microfarad, which is fine, but it has 12 ohms of ESR, so that one's bad. Uh, let's try one of these guys. These are supposed to be 22 microfarad, 25 volt. And this may not be across the board in all units. This could have been due to the exposure that this unit had environmentally. I'm not sure. This is the first one of these that I've worked on. But that one came out 28 with 7 ohms of ESR. Uh, so these ones are all pretty bad. Let's just go for one more of the small ones. This is another 10. I think there's some 4.7s in here that I can check as well. That one's okay, just a little bit high on ESR. Let's see what this one is. I might have been touching the probes there. Oh yeah, that's another high ESR one. So it was a lot of the small ones that had failed in this unit. So you can see there's a pretty high concentration of bad capacitors, so a full recap really is in order on these units. It seems like the American-made stuff, they used good quality caps, but they just didn't hold up as well as the ones used in Japanese stuff. So these ones for reference I think are, I don't know if this is actually Texas Instruments, whatever TI is on, on this capacitor. That may be Texas Instruments, and then these other blue ones were all Rubicon, which are Japanese made, I believe. So I'm not sure what the difference between something like this and a Nichicon or United Chemicon that hold up much better would have been, or an Elna. So yeah, high failure rate on capacitors in this specific unit. I, I did remember that I wanted to cover one thing related to the LED conversion. Now I don't have details on values that I used, but I just wanted to go over this because there's a schematic mistake. It's not only wrong on the schematic, but it's incorrectly drawn on the bottom side of the board layouts. So this took me a while to figure out. I needed some help from some engineer friends of mine to figure out how this circuit would Fun, would fundamentally work with what was there and we determined there must be something that's not drawn properly. So what's going on here is this is the, the secondary from the power transformer for the lamp supply. So this, this comes into this bridge rectifier, turns it into about 6.3 volts DC. That DC is fed to all the lamps, so the plus voltage comes to both the meter lamps and the pilot lamp. The pilot lamp is always connected to ground, so that comes on whenever the unit is on. The Dolby switch is shown here. When it's in the off position, it shorts these two connections together, which ground out the base of this transistor and turn it off. So what happens is when the when the Dolby control is in the off position, 
this transistor is off and it forces the ground path of the meter lamps to come through a 22 ohm resistor. And when they're in stock incandescent, that 22 ohms is enough to create a significant dim level. When it's in any of the other four positions, this transistor base gets a voltage and it bypasses this 22 ohm resistor, taking these straight to ground. So the problem is, when you're converting to LED, this 22 ohms just isn't enough to drop the brightness on the LED. So this needs to be increased in order to uh, to get an actual dimming level to come out of the LED. But I did want to mention that. So on the back side of this board, there's a 22 ohm resistor that ties between the collector and the emitter of Q503. And that's what you'd need to alter if you wanted to get the, uh, the dim level to, to work when you're converting to LED. Okay, there's one other service item that I do want to address, and this is the relay. So this relay stock is a read relay. What it happens is the preamp sends it a voltage between these two outer pins, and then across these pins are each a relay contact. So when the unit powers on, there's a short delay, and then this relay closes and allows the signal to pass. In a normal situation, it should be basically muted or unmuted, but what was going on with this relay is when I powered off the unit, instead of opening up all the way, it must have had some sort of a hold on the inside and it would slowly fizzle out as the power supply drained. So this wasn't working properly. So I removed it and then jumped, uh, jumped the contacts out and with it open and jumped, I was able to get really good performance. So I decided to replace the relay. Now, I only figured this out when I was doing my final listening test. This didn't appear during the bench tests because I wasn't looking for it. Uh, the signal level is so low that it really didn't appear on the scopes as anything that was that was alarming. But as soon as I got it hooked up to a power amplifier, um, just that little bit of uh, bleed through is audible. So I replaced this with a different relay. Now, the reason it's on the outside of the board is I already had this thing completely assembled. Ideally, this would be on the back side of the board where the original one was mounted. Um, so I'm not going to share the design of this uh, little relay board because it's not finalized yet. Um, eventually I will redesign this so that it mounts on the backside when the unit's getting rebuilt. And I'm also going to change the relay a little bit. So this I went with it exactly what was in there. It's basically just one set of contacts that's either open or closed. And what I'm getting is still a little bit of bleed. It's way better than it was, but I am getting a little bit of bleed. And I think I can solve that by using a different style relay that has multiple contacts so that when it's closed, it actually shorts the output to ground. So again, I'm not gonna share anything here. I might come back and do a different video. If I ever get a 3600 or a 3800 again, um, I'll do a, a specific video on building a little relay uh, board for it. But this is kind of a one-off, so I'm not gonna go into detail here. All right, I'm gonna demonstrate what the unit is doing now. So right now I've got my tone defeated. I'm going to power on the unit. I have a sine wave, pretty strong sine wave fed into the, uh, into the phono input. And as soon as I power it on, you can hear just a tiny faint uh, audible sine wave. Then when this relay closes, it goes basically silent. And now I have my control here at the volume control. When I power the unit off, it's almost going to immediately mute. So if I have a signal coming in, it's going to mute it out when the unit's powered off. So the muting at power off works pretty darn well. And another thing I noticed, I do have a little bit of bleed on the tape uh, when I engage the tone defeat. So this is with the signal all the way down to zero with the tone defeated. When I bring in the tone circuit, there's just a slight bleed on the left channel only. I'm not even sure if that'll get picked up in the mic. So those are kind of just the remaining um, spurious issues that this thing has. Uh, and this is just how some of these vintage units are. I don't know exactly where it's happening, but there's just a tiny bit of bleed when the tone circuit's engaged. And again, I would be able to improve the, uh, the output a little bit by redesigning this relay board a little bit. But anyways, that's the, that's the last thing I wanted to talk about related to service. Okay, so for all of you that have stuck around till the end of this video, and put up with my rambling on this 3800, I've got a special treat for you. I have access to a 150 tuner, so I thought it would be neat to connect these together. So I have the scope output from the 3800 connected to the external input of the model 150. So what we're seeing up here in four channel mode is it's showing the, the left and right channel in a V. So left uh, there and right here. If we had the rear channels hooked up, we'd get an additional two lines coming down on this part of the disp display showing the other two channels. And right now I'm actually monitoring the auxiliary. So this is music that I'm feeding in from, uh, from Sonos into my auxiliary input. If we go over to the tuner, we're actually looking at the output of the, of the tuner itself. Let's see, let me get onto a station here, stereo station. So we can see some stereo separation here. If I flip this into mono, 
we'll see that go to a straight line because there's no difference between left and right. Stereo and mono. So this gives you an idea of how you could use the oscilloscope uh, integration here to kind of analyze the signals that are coming out of the 3800. And then we also have a regular tuner mode, which is, uh, if we listen to the audio here, or went to the, the two channel display here, that's a more conventional uh, display that you get on a tuner oscilloscope. So I thought it would be just kind of neat to show off this uh, function here and give you an idea of what you can do with those scope outputs or how you might look at those signals. Thanks again for coming by the channel and checking out this video on the Model 3800. If you like the content here, I invite you to subscribe and come back for more. We'll see you on the next one.